Moving on to uh, our next keynote speaker, Cheryl Cran. Uh, Cheryl has joined us from Vancouver. She was here for dinner last night, I believe, so she's got the context for uh, for our uh, session over our session here today. <coughs> Sharon is a Gen X slash Zoomer cusper. She's going to tell us what that means um, as we go through the discussion here today. She is a consultant on trends in the workplace. Her consulting firm, Synthesis at Work, is a generational leadership consulting firm and a training company <coughs> with a number of high-profile clients, a number of which are listed in her book. If uh, you get a copy of her book, I noticed on the inside cover. <coughs> and uh, she has uh, recently written a book with a fantastic title, The Control Freak Revolution. Make your most maddening behaviors work for your company and to your advantage. So uh, that is, uh, she's going to talk to us today about leading Gen X, Y, and Zoomers in turbulent times. Welcome, Cheryl. All right. I think we've got volume. Can everybody hear me? Um, my style is a little different than Dawn's. Uh, I, I <laughs> we're actually going to start with participation. So um, on your tables, you have a handout. Uh, they have my smiling face on it. Pick up the one that says leading Gen X, Y, and Z in turbulent times, please. And we're actually going to start uh, with a, um, an activity where you're going to draw a picture. And the picture you're going to draw, by the way, this is not uh, something that requires high levels of education, <laughs> high levels of intellect. All it requires is a sense of humor and an open mind. So um, on the back of that handout, you're going to draw a picture of an animal and you're going to choose to draw the animal of your choice as long as that animal has a tail. So go ahead and draw your best animal now, and I'm going to give you some background music while you do that. Regardless of your generation, how you drew your animal says a lot about you as an individual, as a person. So take a look at your animal. If you drew your animal towards the top of the page, you are a naturally positive and optimistic leader, if it's towards the top of the page. You're not going to like the next one so much. <laughs> if you drew your animal towards the bottom of the page, you tend more towards cynicism, pessimism as a leader. Okay, towards the bottom of the page. If your animal's in the middle of the page, you're what we call a flip-flopper. <laughs> and the people who work with you and for you don't know how to deal with you on any given day. If your animal's facing your left, you're stable and secure, which is good news. You might have a challenging time remembering things like dates and birthdays and that kind of thing. You decide. If your animal's facing your right, you're innovative, you're active, and you have a fairly easy time remembering things like dates, birthdays, that kind of thing. If your animal's facing forward, you are direct. You do not fear or avoid confrontation, and you enjoy playing the devil's advocate. Usually people uh, that have the animal face forward are very proud of that fact. It's like, yes. If you drew your animal with the rear end facing you, <laughs> and it happens at least once in every crowd. You're currently in a state of denial. You need professional help. You can come see me at the break. <laughs> if your animal has very large ears, you're a very good listener. However, if you drew no ears or, or very small ears, you'll want to pay close attention to the rest of the session this morning on communication and, and generations. Take a look at your animal. If you have lots of detail, creases in the animal's ears, eyeballs, hair on the animal's back, toenails, you, my friend, are anal retentive. <laughs> if your animal has very few details, you prefer to focus on the big picture, and as a leader, you don't get too caught up in the finer details. If your animal has four legs showing, you are secure, you are stubborn, and you stick to your ideals. Yes! If your animal has less than four legs showing, and for my analytical personalities in the room, yes, that means three, two, one, or zero legs you are currently going through a period of major personal change. Okay, but who isn't nowadays, right? <laughs> yeah, we all are. I, I see this guy shaking his head. This is a bunch of bombs here. Where's the scientific research behind this, Cheryl? Now, no scientific research, I warned you. It's just for fun. Take a look at your animal's tail. Take, take a look at your neighbor's animal's tail. Hold up your animal so the tables around you can see your animal's tail. The longer of a tail you drew, the more satisfied you are with your love life. <laughs> How'd you do, Gabe? <laughs> All right, 
So you may say to yourself, what's this got to do with the generations? Uh, what we just experienced was participation, which Gen Y absolutely lives for, longs for, wants to have in the workplace, which is what Don just spoke about. We actually, as a generation, dominant generation in this room is baby boomer, um, and yet we enjoy it too. But what we've done, because of what Don said, which is so true, is we've been a broadcast to generation. So we are what we call um, order takers. So we do very well at taking instruction, and when asked in the past in our work environment to do something different, creative, to think on your own, we might have been chastised, judged, or ridiculed because we were not following the rules of how we were taught to be in a work environment, but also to lead. So many of us have been taught that autocratic leadership is, has been the way to lead. And yet Gen Y today says, no, I don't respond to autocratic leadership, I respond to collaborative leadership. Now for those of us in this room who've led for a while, it's a really tough transition to go from autocracy to collaborative leadership. And in fact, what we will find is an inner resistance to it. Not because we're control freaks, hence my book title. I actually wrote that book because I'm a recovering control freak. Uh, and, and that I feel that all leaders actually, if you take positive control, you will be successful as a collaborative leader. That's the premise of that book. But the point is to go from autocratic to collaborative requires what we just did, a sense of humor. It requires participation. And it requires the ability for us as leaders to look at ourselves and not have um, such a strong opinion of ourselves, not take ourselves so seriously. Uh, I don't stand here before you as a highly educated leader. I don't have a PhD in psychology, and I've actually been uh, attacked by an audience member on that very fact, which I'll share, I'll share that story in a bit. Um, all of my learning has been in the street learning, on the street learning, and certificates of learning that I've gone along, but I don't have a formalized degree from college or university. My first leadership uh, position, though, was at the age of 20 in the financial industry. And uh, I don't know if any of you can relate to this, especially the boomers in the room, but the, the way to get into leadership in those days was by sink or swim. You remember that style of learning? <laughs> Today's Gen X and Y says, do not set me up with a sink or swim environment. I will not accept it. I will not tolerate it. In fact, I'll leave and go somewhere else where they'll support me to succeed. But the boomer, we did it because that's what it was. It was, you figure it out, it's sink or swim. And we actually used to enjoy watching people sink. You know, if we're really honest, it was like, let's see if they can figure this out, you know, and it was trial by fire. Uh, interestingly enough, when I was in banking, I was a teller first. I was actually in banking in the days when the interest rates were 22 to 10. I graduated high school in 1981. I went right into banking because my parents told me that would be a good thing to do. We, my parents did not have the financial wherewithal to send me to college or university. I grew up on a farm in Saskatchewan, and uh, so I went right into banking. <laughs> And so I go into banking and I'm a teller and I'm watching people come to my wicket breaking down in tears because interest rates are 22% and they're losing everything they own. And I remember having a two, two thoughts at that time and that's why I call myself a Gen X Zoomer Cusper, by the way, because anyone who's in this room between the ages of 46 and 48 would be considered a Cusper. You're not quite a Boomer and you're not quite a Gen Xer, but you're considered a Cusper. Uh, a Zoomer, by the way, is a Boomer who refuses to age. And it's actually a true term coined by Moses Zamer, who um, many of you know, um, you know his history. And he's actually created a magazine called Zoomer Magazine. I encourage you to pick it up. Very progressive, very fast forward, very uh, applicable to the Zoomer who refuses to age. Um, so here I was in banking as a teller, watching people lose their homes and their businesses. My own father, who was 43 at the time, started a business in Osuya, British Columbia and bought the business in 1980 and in 1982 filed for bankruptcy and a year later died of a heart attack. That particular time frame for me was very, very impactful. Dr. Phil would call it a defining moment. And so what it determined for me was, okay, if I have no control over the financial situation, if I have no control over uh, my education, in fact, my parents sending me to education, I do have control over my own upward mobility. That was my decision at that time. So I got promoted to customer service, and one day without any warning, two guys with masks and sawed-off shotguns come bar barreling through the side door. Ordered everybody to the floor. Except for me, I stood there standing, and I don't know if any of you can relate to this, but I get a little sarcastic when I'm under pressure. And I stood there until one of the gunmen came to me, put the gun to my head, and said, I said, get to the floor. And I looked at him and I said, well, why didn't you say so in the first place? And I got to the floor. I'm on the floor, I have two thoughts. Number one, man, am I stupid. And number two, we really need to clean these carpets. Really need to be cleaned. And 
as I was on the floor, I could feel myself almost in a twilight zone environment, but I could see my boss out of the corner of my eye, Doreen, in the corner, absolutely in shock, traumatized. And I could hear children crying in the teller's lineup because family, there was mothers there with their kids. And I remember, you know, once the robbery was over, getting up, and I don't know where this came from. Maybe it was growing up on a farm in Saskatchewan. I don't know, but I, I was able to call 911. I was able to give full description because I was the last one standing. And my boss, Doreen, said to me, Cheryl, you handle yourself so well under pressure, we'd like to promote you. <laughs> and they promoted me to the second highest robbery branch in the city. <laughs> so be careful what you're good at. And that was the sign of the times. In other words, if you demonstrated it, uh, something, then it was like, we're going we're gonna to promote you. And they promoted me to the second highest robbery branch in the city. And I was uh, 22 years old, and I had nine people reporting to me, all of them older than I was. I was fantastic at handling myself well under pressure. Fantastic at it. In fact, we had nine more robberies in the years that I was there. I was very good at managing robberies. In fact, my sense of humor when robbers would come in, and by the way, in, in Vancouver, uh, this is in an area called Burnaby, many, 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 many of you will be familiar with Burnaby, it was Edmonton Kingsway area, which has since been revitalized, but in those days, it was not a great area, and this particular bank had a back door and front door. Robbers would come in the back door, do their thing, leave out the front door. So it became very sort of predictable. So every month I would expect a robbery, uh, usually around um, Wednesday of the month when people were low income. <laughs> it was kind of like very predictable. There was a pattern to it. And uh, so when they would come in, I'd say, welcome, fellas. You're right on time. We're already on the floor. Uh, the money's in the till. Help yourself. Let us know when you leave. And honestly, they'd come in, go to the till, take the money, and they'd leave. And my staff on the, on the floor would be looking at me with nervous laughter, but we would make it through. And in fact, after the robbery was over, we'd all have this almost like this giddy kind of, hoo-hoo, aren't we good? We're, we made it through and we did it. Now, I was excellent at managing myself under stress, but I was a lousy leader. Why? Because I believed autocratically as a young woman in finance that I had to behave, please, gentlemen, pardon this, but I had to behave like men did in leadership, which was be strong, be assertive, be aggressive, and not allow any collaboration in my leadership. <coughs> And it worked for me in managing robberies, but it did not work for my, my upward mobility. And in fact, it's because I had a leader who recognized at a young age, and I'm speaking about this from a lack of generation, it doesn't matter what age you are. How many of us in this room have had leaders that have spoken to who we are as an individual, and therefore we were able to progress and move forward? And in my case, I've been so blessed to have those leaders, but in this case, this leader said, you're excellent at managing yourself in a, a robbery situation, but you're a lousy leader of people. Didn't want to hear that, but it was the truth. And I remember thinking to myself, how dare she say that to me? I just managed nine robbers. But what she said is, Cheryl, you're like a bull in a china shop. The customers love you, you get things done, but the people are coming in and complaining about you all the time. The sign of a very good leader is someone, regardless of the generation, who can tell you the truth. And I think what happens a lot in Canada and in the U.S. in leaders is that we actually, in, in government, dare I say this, at the risk of you hating me, I feel we allow poor performers to get away with behavior that needs to be told honestly does not support where we're going in the future. I've been blessed to have that. People, those people tell me that. This particular leader said, you're like a bull in a china shop. I went, oh, oh, oh. I went home to my husband, Reg. We've been together now for over 20 years. At the time, it was not as many years. And I remember saying to him, can you believe the audacity that I'm like a bull in a china shop? He looked at me and he kind of went, uh-huh. And I went back to my leader the next morning and I said, well, I don't like what you said, but I actually value your opinion, so now give me the tools to do what I need to do to be better. Now, Gen Y today, there's no way, and I, I don't know how many Gen Ys I have in the room. You're in your 20s, so can I just see how many Gen Ys I have in the room, if any? Okay, excellent, excellent. Good percentage in this room, actually, for the number of people. That's fantastic. But there isn't a Gen Y in this room today that would willingly take a job where you get robbed by gunpoint nine times a year. Is that true, Gen Y? In fact, they'd say my life is way more important than that. You can't pay me enough. But as a boomer, why did I do it? Boomers, why, do we, why did we do it? Because it was the job, is what we were told to do. I never once thought to myself, my life is in jeopardy, I shouldn't be doing this. 
I said to myself, this is my job. Cool fundamental difference between attitudes with the generation. So let's take a look at your knowledge here. And how many of you feel like this on any given day in the workplace? I've got music with it. There it is. Blackberry messaging over here, phone message over here, customer coming to ask me this here, I've got my coworker asking me this here, my boss wants this here. This is the reality of today's life. This is not going away. This is what it is. The generational language challenge we all face is are we actually as leaders adapting to not only the stimulation of the vastness of, of how fast change is happening in our workplace, but to the changing dynamic of the people we're interacting with on a daily basis. Every one of us in this room, who you are sitting in this room today is not who you were two days ago. We are changing our minds as fast today that it used to take us five years to change our minds on something. Our opinions are so diverse. So let's look at the Gen Y language. Many of you are going to know what this, uh, this is, uh, but let's do a test of the room. The first one, what's that stand for? Okay, laugh out loud. The next one, the, the Gen Ys are going to nail this, by the way. <laughs> MOS, mother over shoulder. <laughs> if you've got teenagers, you want to know that one. That's, that's an important one. Next one's very similar, PAW. Parents are watching. That one too is very well, is something you need to know. The next one, pretty easy to spell it out yourself. See you later. The one after that, tricky one. Rolling on the floor laughing, yes. And the one after that, too bad for you too. And then the one after that, very simple, talk to you later. I thought Don's presentation was phenomenal. I've read his books. Um, the man is in incredible. And he's absolutely right when he says, uh, and how many of you do have kids in this room, like let's say 13 and older? Okay. Um, how many of you try phoning your child and they will not answer the phone, but the moment you text them, you get an instant response? Okay. And that's what this is speaking to. So this is an interesting dynamic because what I'm not addressing today is, is the traditionalist generation, which is 65 and older. And for those of you who have traditionalists in your life, I have an 82-year-old um, mother-in-law who says to me, Courtney never phones me. And Reg and I say, well, welcome to our world because she doesn't phone anybody. <laughs> so then we say to our 82-year-old mother-in-law, mother do you want to take up texting? And she looks at us and goes, texting? What the heck is that? Not even in their reality. So the gap, and, and I know Don says there is no gap, but as far as communication gap, there is definitely between the traditionalists and the Gen Y. Uh, it's less of a gap as the generations come closer. How many Gen Xers in the room? You're in your 30s for the Gen Xers. Okay. The Gen X generation is actually feeling a lot of stress in the workplace right now because what they're finding themselves is they are actually placed unwillingly into a mediator role. So the Gen X is actually mediating the boomer mentality to the Gen Y and vice versa. Now, many, many of you cuspers are doing the same thing. So if you're in that cusper zone that I mentioned, 46 to 48, you're finding yourself being the bridge between the generations. A lot of times Gen Y, it depends on the, on the percentage in the workplace, but Gen Y will, will be frustrated with the boomer, but they understand that there's rules that they must adhere to in order to continue forward. And I think that the day is coming, similar to what John said, where there's open dialogue without fear of punishment without fear of if I speak my truth, I'm somehow going to be, my career's gonna be stalled or I'm not gonna be able to move as, uh, as forward as I want. So do me a favor right now, don't worry about the flu. I mean, let's get over that, but put your hands up palm to palm with the people you're seated with. We'll get some Purell later on or you can wash your hands. We'll, we'll get you handled, but let's put your hand up palm to palm around your table with the people you're seated with, please. Okay. And without indicating who's going to do what, someone push. Now. Oh, interesting, interesting. Hands down. So, room full of highly intelligent people. And uh, what did everybody do, generally? Push back. Why? Oh, oh, see, every time it's so beautifully set up. I love it. Over here, I heard resistance, balance, but then I heard someone over here say, You told us to. Who said that? A boomer every single time. I have never had a Gen Y or a Gen X say to me because you told us to. Fascinating. It actually reestablishes that we will do what we are told. Okay. However, when I gave that instruction, that exercise, I did give a key word. Does anybody know what the key word was? Someone. 
So there actually was choice in that exercise, correct? Did I not use the word someone in this, in this in instance? Because typically I do. I said someone. Okay, so then a boomer will always say, well, I'm someone. Yes, you are. And yes, but the reason we actually push is because for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Now, I, I actually do that exercise to point out that what we do in the workplace as leaders, as coworkers, even with, with the clients that we serve, is typically, for most of us, and I'm generalizing, we react to what's happening versus create movement and move something in a different direction. So what we don't want to do as leaders is push back against the generational attitudes or the, the, the collaboration move that we're heading and we want to instead move with it. So let's try this again, hands up, palm to palm with the people you're seated with. And this time, <laughs> now you're gonna listen very carefully, without indicating who's going to do what, someone push, someone give slightly, go now. All right, hands down. So, so typically, and that's you know part of this is because you've already had the first part of the exercise, so a little bit you know a little bit of uncertainty there. But typically, that that second time around, three things happen. Number one, neither person push. And and in that scenario, it's interesting because if that was a, if that happened with you and the other person, neither person push. That's actually not a bad thing, because if you think about the application in the work environment. Sometimes, specifically with generational gaps, like if you're not seeing something in the same way as someone else, sometimes the best strategy as a leader is to say or do absolutely nothing. Many of us don't use that strategy as often as we use the somebody's got to do something, which by the way is a boomer mentality. Okay, so boomer mentality is if I don't do it, nobody's going to do it. Right? Which you, we've actually created our own leadership crisis with that mentality. Because as long as we say, if I don't do it, nobody's going to do it, guess who keeps doing it? And we actually perpetuate the cycle of, you know, I have many leaders that say, I feel like a glorified babysitter. Why am I the only one who does this? And how come they don't? It's because you have established a pattern that people have become accustomed to, which is you'll take care of it if nobody else does. No different than raising children, by the way. We all know this. We're highly intelligent people. But however, as a leadership, that is something that we constantly do is we think, well, I've got to, I've got to do something. I can't say or do nothing. Now let's transfer this to personal life. Again, with those of you with children, I have a 21-year-old daughter, Courtney. I have two stepsons, 27 and 29. And with Courtney, um, in her teenage years, she had a bit of a rough go. Can anybody relate? <laughs> 15 was the magical year, to be honest. Um, I have her permission to share this with you. And... Um, one of the things, she came home and had done something that I didn't think was a great choice on her part. But the old me would have been, what's wrong with you? You should have done this. I didn't raise you to do this. Why didn't you think of this? And do all the things we parents do because we're afraid and frightened for their safety. Instead, this time, both my husband and I chose to say or do absolutely nothing. We did not say a thing. The next day she comes to me and she says, is everything okay? Yeah, why do you? Well, because what I did was not great. And I know you and dad aren't happy with me. Well, you know, honestly, Mom, come on now. I, I think, I, think I, I deserve to be punished. Actually, Mom, I think that the punishment I should have is drown myself for a week. Okay. So you know as intelligent people that saying or doing nothing is sometimes a very viable choice, especially with generations, because a lot of times we might say something to a generation. For example, a generational um, generalization is uh, that they don't, they're not prompt. They don't like to come to work on time. If you say that out loud, you're actually creating the pushback and the resistance. And most Gen Ys will tell you that they're not as adherent to time as we boomers are. Now they'll show up, but we need to communicate to them what is the incentive for them to show up. Whereas a boomer says, well, that's just common sense. You start times at nine, you show up, right? So notice the, the sort of the different mentalities around it. Second thing that happened in that exercise, if you were the person that pushed, you're highly aggressive. You too need professional help. I'm just teasing. But if you were the one who pushed and the other person was giving, you would have found yourself easing up on the pushing. Again, normal human psychological reaction for every action is equal and opposite reaction. So as a leader, if I have the ability, if you're pushing on me your viewpoint, your attitude, something I don't agree with, and I have the ability to move this forward in a different way, which in my second segment, communicating with diverse teams, talking about communication in a, in a way that moves things forward, versus causes that pushback, 
then we're going to have a relationship that creates give and take. If in that exercise you were the person who gave, you might have thought to yourself, I don't want to give. Or it feels like I'm losing. Or whatever that might be. And that actual mentality is the ego's way of protecting itself to say giving is losing. Yet in today's collaborative generational leadership environment, giving is moving the relationship forward. I'm not talking about laying on the floor and letting people take advantage of us. I'm talking about giving up our attachment to control, giving up our attachment to identity, giving up our need to be right all of the time. Let's do this again one more time. Hands up, Hong Kong. This, this time, just moving back and forth with your table, back and forth. Kumbaya. No, I'm just teasing. Hands up. I am from Vancouver. I had to do that, right? You know, the whole... The, the whole thing with the Vancouverites being that way. Um, yeah, I think that's where the term came from, was the low pants. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, it's a French comic. It was sent to me by a French client from Montreal, so it is, hence the uh, accent on generation. Uh, the truth is, with Gen Y, is there, what I consider them to be misunderstood. Sorry, I'm having technical challenges here. Let's go with this. Uh, shifts in views. Here's really what the differences are. And you may know, already know this. We're hearing a lot about generations. None of what I'm presenting to you is brand new. But what I'm trying to do with you this morning is have you think about how you can apply, A, what Don presented to us, which is how do we create a more collaborative government environment? How do we create a more sharing environment? I think that's a big task. I mean, that's something that requires strategic planning and, and all sorts of uh, um, thought around. But really, in today's session, what I'd like you to think about personally, individually, is how can I personally shift my interactions and communications with the different generations, both at home and at work, to create more results, more success. That comic there, uh, you was our dad, now you are dead, <laughs> with instant messaging, and then it says, I'm amazed it got past the vicar. But here's, let's look at the, the main differences in viewpoints and shifts in viewpoints. Gen Y wants a life first and career path. So how many of you have noticed as leaders that when a Gen Y comes in for an interview or even uh, existing Gen Y employees, they don't want to just know what their tasks are. They want to know where they're going. So where am I going to be in six months? Where am I going to be in a year? Where am I, where am I going to be 18 months? Now, the latest research says that the average Gen Y's tenure in any job is about three years. And that's actually generous, I feel, in, in my opinion. But, but three years is sort of the, the average tenure. So a baby boomer mentality could view that as what? Honest forum here for discussion. What might we view a three-year tenure as? Lack of commitment, OK? Uh, we might even look at it as disloyal. Lack of loyalty, OK? Jen, why would say to you, incorrect. I'm actually committed to you in those three years more than you'll ever know, is what they would say to you. And they would also say to you, I'm not loyal to the employer. I'm loyal to the leader and the people I work with. So it's differently placed loyalty. It's not disloyal. Does, does that make sense to everyone? So you've heard that saying, people don't leave their jobs, they leave their leaders. It is, it is triply true for Gen Y. Do not underestimate the likability factor as a leader when it comes to leading Gen Y. If they don't like you, if they can't relate to you, if they don't feel that you get them, they lessen their tenure and they will move on. They do not have the same concerns we have around um, survival. Please, Gen Y, don't get upset with me when I use generalizations here, but typically, I will tell you something, the average Gen Y in the research that I've done does not leave home until the age of 35. By the way, by the time they leave home, they are not a Gen Y. Why would that happen? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Parents didn't throw them out, absolutely true, but why else? Is there a Gen Y that wants to tell me why, maybe, you know, maybe there's a Gen Y in this room, everybody's independent, but why would any of your friends <laughs> still live at home? Anyone? They don't feel the need. There's no compelling need to leave. When we were 18, baby boomers, how many of you in this room left home at 18? I did. And did we want to leave? Yeah. And what did our parents say to us when we left? Don't come back. <laughs> Not because they were bad parents, but because at that time, if you left, you made your bed, go sleep in it. That was our parents' values. Our kids, who we've raised, which are the Gen Ys, say, my parents are cool. 
They're pretty liberal with their rules. In fact, there's hardly any rules. My parents are, you know, uh, the, uh, why would I leave? Mom still cooks for me. Okay? So here's the deal. When you say to a Gen Y who works for you, do this or you're fired, or deal with it, this is who I am as your boss, they have no qualms about saying, I'm out of here. They don't have the same survival issues that boomers had at their same age. So you say to a Gen Y, do this or you're fired, they look at you and they go, whatever. Honestly, it does not hold any weight, which then, if you say, if you recognize leadership in our day, boomers, it was do this or you're fired, which is autocratic leadership. We responded to that. It's not something that's responded to today. And by the way, if you said that to a, a Zoomer or a Gen X, they wouldn't respond to that either in today's world because the world has changed and we're no longer under that same leadership guide. But the life first, career second. Gen Y says, if I want to take a day to go skiing, what's the big deal? I want to go skiing. I'm going to still work hard. Gen Y also says, I've got my Blackberry if you need me, or my iPhone. Okay, Very, very, very different. Gen X is having their family, and their strengths are matched to their job and products. That's what projects, that's what they prefer. How many Gen Xs in the room again? You're in your 30s? Okay. Uh, here's the thing with Gen X. They bought into the boomer work principle. They bought into it because they had to, because boomers were still the dominant generation in the workplace. But here's what happens with Gen X, is they say, yeah, I'll work hard, I'll put in the time, but what's the one factor, Gen X, that changes it for you more so than it changed for the boomers? Having your family. The moment Gen X starts to have kids, they say, okay, I can't work as hard as I've been working. Now I need to have a little bit more flexibility. I need to see my daughter's ballet class. I need to go to the soccer game. Boomers, many of us in this room, not that we're bad parents, but many of us did not take the time off of work to go to the ballet classes, to go to the soccer games. Why? Because we felt if we did that, our employer would view us as not being serious about our work. Different viewpoints. So the boomer's mentality was work, 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 and then you die. Here's what's changed. Research since the recession says that the average Zoomer will not retire as planned. Retirement has been pushed, and with mandatory retirement listed in, in some of the provinces, I think. Ontario it is listed, correct, and BC it's been listed, I think Alberta as well. So with that being listed, a lot of government was concerned about, oh, the brain drain, you know, all these Zoomers are going to retire and we're going to be stuck with, you know, that's not going to happen to the level that they thought it was. Now what's happening, and some government groups I've worked with are actually, you know, farther along on the train than, on this than others, but a lot of them are actually bringing the Zoomer back on contract, they're extending the work period that they're working. A lot of things are happening. And by the way, for Zoomers, if you're sitting here going, oh my gosh, I don't know what this means for me, the future for Zoomers is brighter than it's ever been before because you'll have more choice and flexibility than you've ever had before. And some of you are already experiencing that. Because government needs your brain, they need your, your on-the-job experience, but you'll get to decide as you get closer to retirement how you want to do it, which is very exciting. And I feel government has more of an advantage over public in that regard because you, you guys are very progressive in, in, in areas like diversity and you know, working from home and flex time and all those things. So Zoomers are also burdened right now in the workplace with self-created stress, not just in the workplace of trying to manage the change as we move forward, but personally they're challenged with two things. They've got, they're called the squeeze generation because they've got elderly parents that they're caring for, and then they've got family at home. And I'm personally experiencing this right now. My father-in-law passed away last December. My mother-in-law, they were married for 60 years. And my mother-in-law never drove, never did her own banking. I mean, this is, I mean, this is that was that generation. And so this last year for me has been extremely stressful, and my husband, in, in getting her moved from her home that she lived with her husband into assisted living and, and getting her to believe that that was a good thing and having her believe for two months that we were awful, evil people <laughs> and who just in the last month is saying to us it's the best thing that ever happened. But talk about a stressful year, because on top of that, I've got a 21-year-old. You know how we say that our kids aren't leaving until the age of 35? My husband and I are breaking that statistic, because she's not leaving, but we are. So we are selling our suburban home, we are moving into a condo, and we've said to her, you have two choices. You may come with us, or you may go out on your own. What would you like to do? She said, We'd li I'd like to go out on my own. I said, great. Good life lesson. Now, here's the, the deal. For any of you who your kids are out of the house, university, college, guess what? They're coming back. 
generally they're coming back. Why? Why not? Cost of living, mom will cook for me, mom will take care for take care of me, dad will do the, dad will give me allowance money, you know. Very, very different. Now, um, this is not a government example, but it is a private example, is using, and Don alluded to this in his presentation, using technology to engage and collaborate with Gen Y. And just some examples, J.D. Powers in the U.S. Uh, actually did a survey of which are the uh, fast food organizations that Gen Ys are following and therefore frequenting more often on social media, and this was the list, with Arby's being number one, Cold Stone Creamery number two, Subway third, and Taco Bell fourth. And the reason I have the McDonald's logo in there is that I spoke for McDonald's Corporation in Washington, D.C. last month. And although McDonald's is, you know, the fast food nation, they are absolutely behind the times on their in-store technology and in their reaching out to the demographic. And they recognize that and they're working on it right now. How many of you in this room, you're actually um, attracting employees from places like Craigslist, Facebook, Twitter? No? YouTube? A lot of organizations now are actually going, putting, posting a video on YouTube saying, hi, we're ABC Corporation and we're looking for people like this, this, and this. They're using the media to go to the, to the, to the demographic that they're looking for. Okay? Now, in government, I don't know, are you guys allowed to Skype or instant message? Yes? No? No, you're all looking at me like I'm an alien now. Okay. Uh, Don's right, when you take away Facebook and you take away the medium for the way Gen Y communicates, and here's what happens with Gen Y, by the way, if it's not allowable within the workplace, they're using their Blackberry, they're doing it anyway. And if you don't think they're doing it at work, I can tell you that they are, generally. So maybe they're not doing it at the desk, but when they're running to the washroom, they're BBMing their friends. Or they're quickly checking their status, or it is part of their life. And I do a lot of work with financial institutions, credit unions, banks. One credit union actually, rather than fight the social media need for Gen Y, have created forums for them to experience that. So in the lunchroom, they've got laptops open, and they're allowed to Facebook their heart's content, do whatever they want, um, other than you know appropriate websites and those kinds of things. But they're allowed to use the medium to do what it is they want to do. Um, I recognize there's privacy concerns and, and all sorts of things within government, but. Think about it, email is actually a very slow communication device compared to instant messaging. How many of you right now personally use Skype with video to talk to people around the world? Okay. Um, I'm also a consultant in, the, in addition to, to the speaking and the writing that I do, and so oftentimes I'll be on the phone and, and I do team consulting. So if you're on the phone doing team consulting, we're on the phone, I have my headset on, and I've got my Skype IM up with my other team members so that even though we're talking to the client, I can know what my other teammates are thinking simply by them IMing me. And so it's a very fast, efficient way of getting results without being face-to-face. -face. So the, the technology is really what created the gap, which is what Don has asserted. And really, we're, are, we have not even hit the tip of the iceberg of what the technology is going to be doing for us in the next few years. How many of you are familiar uh, and probably use Bluetooth right now, uh, uh, you know, when you're on your cell phone, use it? Okay, right now there's actually technology and it's coming out in the next year where there's a clip-on visor, it's very lightweight, that will come down in front of your viewing field and instead of opening a PDF or an, an eight and a half by 11 document on your PDA, you will actually be able to view it as if you were looking at a computer, computer screen. So if you do a lot of work with documents, this is actually going to revolutionize the way we look at documents. How many of you, I'm on my Blackberry, I try to open a document. I, I mean, especially as boomers, we all wear eyeglasses, unless you've had LASIK, right? So that, you know, these types of things, so that, that, that is actually a year away. The technology's there, they're integrating it as we speak. Um, you know, IMing with photos, creative solutions using technology, uh, Twitter, Flickr, Facebook, you know, Don, all the websites that Don gave us, uh, Gen Y and Gen X are saying, why can't I solve this collaboratively? I don't have to come up with all the answers. Whereas boomers, we were taught that we as leaders needed to have all the answers. And in fact, if we didn't have all the answers, we were viewed as not being a good leader. The better leaders today are the ones that say, I will facilitate the flow of information of the people that I have working with me and for me. That it's more of a facilitative leadership role versus um, uh, uh, dictatorial. And this is really the reality. Mommy, can I go to Timmy's website and play? Again, Zoomers, how many of us in this room, when we were kids, we were told to go outside and play? 
right? And we would go disappear. How many of us as teenagers, we didn't have to worry about being tracked down with a, with a cell phone or a GPS. Our kids today, by the time the average 12-year-old, 13-year-old has a cell phone, and why do we parents provide them with that? Safety, staying in communication, but we didn't have any of that as children, okay? So, interesting, my daughter the other day, I came home, she was playing on the Nintendo Wii. I don't know if any of you have attempted Nintendo Wii, they've simplified it and dumbed it down specifically for us. Although our younger kids like to play it and enjoy it, but that's really what Nintendo has said, they've simplified it for the boomer application. In fact, the, grow, the biggest gaming demographic, guess what it is? Women between 30 and 50. Part of that's the Wii Fit. Have any of you used the Wii Fit or tried the Wii Fit? It's phenomenal, it's easy to use and, and uh, it's very fun. But I come home, my daughter's playing rock band on the Wii and she's having a blast and she's laughing and I'm, I, I said to her, what are you doing? She goes, I'm, I'm, I'm playing rock band. I said, well, why are you having such a good time? She goes, I'm playing with three guys from China. They suck. I mean, we went outside and played. <laughs> Our kids are playing video games with kids around the world. No child born after 1980 has lived without technology. Completely different. How many of you in this room, when you got your Blackberry, you did not program it, you handed it to your child so that they could program it for you? How many of us still with technology read the manual? You give your Gen Y or, or a teenager a device and they do not read the manual. They go right into the device to find the help codes. They figure it out within minutes. They are absolutely innate with the technology. It's not something they need to learn. And really that is the differentiating factor. Technology is the new PhD. And I love John's analogy of you know the technology, the kid doing laps around the parents because what that's causing is a little bit of an ego kick for us boomers. And if you're willing to admit it in this room, boomers or zoomers, when we are faced with some younger person who's highly technically advanced, there is a little bit of sense of inferiority, would you not agree? The biggest opportunity for us moving forward is to capitalize on it, not fight it, not push back against it. To really harness it and say, okay, I'm not good at this, but this person is, how do I use this as a leader? Versus feel inferior to it. Because our skills as Zoomers, here's where our skills continue to lie. We are strategic planners, we are visionaries, we're able to start a project and bring it to completion. Not that Gen Ys can't do that, but they look at it more from a, a, a global, superfluous technological standpoint. Gen Ys appreciate the Zoomer's ability to strategically step towards a goal. But how can we take that Zoomer mentality and the X ability to blend both technology and human relations with the Y's highly technical ability and create a workplace where we're all feeling validated, where we're all contributing? where we're all moving forward. I, I actually feel very, very optimistic about the future because we are evolving. Even though we have challenges going on, we are evolving. And Gen Y, how many of you in this room, your kids are calling you on your stuff? You know, I mentioned to you that my daughter, you know, that, that we, we suggested that she either come with us or move, and so the other day she said, can we go look at apartments? And I thought, well, this is gonna be interesting because now we've got a bit of a reality check, right? And so we went looking at this one apartment. It was an older building. They had advertised it as renovated, but it wasn't. So we go into this apartment, and I could just see Courtney's face. She's just, like, mortified. And when we leave the apartment, she goes, they call that renovated? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my. And she's totally, absolutely having a rant about this place. And I was driving, and I pulled my Prius over. <laughs> I looked at Courtney, and I said, Courtney, I realize that as a parent, I have failed you. I have failed you. I have spoiled you, your dad and I have spoiled you rotten. You know nothing but luxury. You do not know what the real world is about or what needs to happen here, and I need to help you now. So she says to me, Mom, are you saying that I have to settle? I said, well, what do you mean? She says, well, um, you've raised me my entire life to go for what I want, <laughs> to shoot high, to challenge the status quo, and now you're telling me the motivational speaker mom that I have to settle? Because right now you're not being very motivating, mom. I said, you know what, Courtney, you're absolutely right. I am actually telling you to settle, but let's actually blend settling with reality with going for what you want. And let's, because how many of you find with Gen Y, they do have very idealistic hopes 
And so it's not that they're wrong, it's that we as parents have set that up for them. So as a leader, we can, we can denounce it, we can go, oh, what's wrong with them? And oh my God, reality check, and oh, where's the common sense? Or we look and go, wait a minute, I haven't equipped this Gen Y to see the reality of what it is here and how we can blend the current reality with what their mentality is. So it's really fascinating. And I have my work cut out for me, by the way, with my daughter, it's still not over. <laughs> it's a long way to go. But technology is the new PhD. What did we do before GPS? We read a map, and how many of you used to then print it off MapQuest and would put the overhead light on and almost get into an accident trying to read MapQuest off the printed document? Now we have GPS. When I was speaking in Montreal in August, I had to go from Montreal to Bromont, and um, beautiful little community, Bromont. And, and I just assumed, because I, when I go to places, I drive all the time. I'm, I'm very uh, flexible. I have no challenge doing that. So I'm just thinking, okay, I'll get a GPS and I'll have no problem. But r little did I know that the GPS doesn't speak French. So the roots, if you know, oué and all is it, the French words, it would, it, the GPS is going, auto rue de gade. I'm like, what? So I, I, I'm talking to the GPS. What's wrong with you? I'm lost, right? So three times talking to the GPS, I pull over. Um, I finally figure out that what it's doing is mispronouncing west and east in English. And so once I got that straight, I made my way from Montreal to Bromont. When I got to Bromont, the actual audience stood up and gave me a standing ovation because they said, we can't find our way out of Montreal. So I, they, they figured that I had done a good job there. How many of you are familiar with Nexus? Yes, the government program. Uh, Nexus is the iris scan to get through customs. I travel a lot between the US and Canada. I don't know what I would do without Nexus, but before then, what did we do? We stood in line, like everybody else, in customs, and we waited. So the technology is what, it's actually helping us. It's also created the gap. Um, robotic surgery. Uh, just read in the Globe and Mail, I think it was three weeks ago, robotic heart surgery is overtaking traditional heart surgery in Canada and in the U.S. Now, some of you might be frightened. Healthcare, you might, healthcare probably knows about this, but you might be frightened of that, but do you know that the human error, which Don referred to in hospitals and in medicine, is a, is a high cause of death. Robotic surgery, 99% success rate for heart surgery. So just looking at the differences that we're all facing, um, poking a little bit of fun at our traditionalist parents. Okay, your father managed to get a mouse, now how do we use it? I know, it's a, it's a lame one, but... In fact, how many of your parents actually are quite good with at least checking email and using the internet for basic things? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Although my uh, father-in-law, before he passed, he, he was an ex-banker. I actually, my husband's a banker, and we met in the bank. And uh, but my father-in-law used to say, I'm not doing online banking. I don't know what those people behind the machine are doing. You know, that was, that was his belief. So, same with ATMs. He thought there were people sitting behind that machine doing bad things with his money. You know, that was his perception. So, uh, just a couple things. Recent, recent research said it would take three Gen Ys to replace one Zoomer. This has changed. The reason for that is we are making such rapid technological advance that that's no longer holding the truth of when that was, that was the statistic, which was just simply two years ago. And in fact, many Zoomers get very proud. They go, yeah, it takes three people to do what I did. What's wrong with that picture? Do you not see that there's something wrong with that picture? It's a, what we've done as Zoomers is we believe the motto that you have to work hard, and we've actually absolutely, totally integrated that to almost our demise. More Boomers now are saying, no, 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 that's no longer working for me. I need balance. I want to spend time with my family, is that the pendulum is swinging back. Uh, Zoomers are holding on to the hard drive. For the Zoomers in this room, you have so much intellectual knowledge that organizations, both government and private right now, their biggest concern is downloading that hard drive. How do they capture what you know before you leave? Because what's going to happen is if you leave with that hard drive, organizations do not have the history or the data that they need in order to move forward successfully. Now many Zoomers hold on to the hard drive and say, I don't need to share it because it's what I know. It's almost like a self-protective mechanism. Those days are now gone. You need to share what you know. You cannot hold on to the information. It does not serve you. It does not serve the organization. And a lot of Zoomers, here's the deal. You actually gain by downloading what you know, not lose. But an insecure Boomer would say, if I tell them what they know, they might not need me. I might be redundant. But if you're a secure and an evolved Boomer, you go, no, I need to share everything I know. Gen X is the uh, at-work squeeze generation. I already mentioned that Zoomers be at home and Gen Ys don't want to do what their parents did. So you know how we didn't want to do what our parents did. And we didn't. 
our Gen Y kids don't want to do what we did. And what I mean by that is they want to be able to have flexibility with their family. They don't want to make their life all about their work. They don't want to have their kids in daycare all of the time. They're looking at what we did as parents and they're saying, I want to do it a little differently. Uh, similar to Dawn's comic here, they grow up too fast. Here's the computer in the laptop, in, in, the, in the crib, or in the pram, pardon me. For us, when we were babies, we had the mobiles that used to play music and, and go over our heads. Today's babies that are born, and you know this if you have grandchildren or you have small kids in your life, they actually have computers that are attached to the side of the crib. It's called a Fisher-Price toy, but it's a computer. They touch it, they coo at it, and it interacts with them at birth. My brother has two daughters. They learned baby sign language when they were six months of age. Kids today are learning communication that maybe take, took some of us in this room years to learn. Very, very different mentality. You know you're a Zoomer when. Getting lucky means finding your car in the parking lot. You look forward to a dull evening. Happy hour is a nap. Your back goes out more than you do and you refuse to age, but your body doesn't listen. Zoomers, how many of you decide you're going to go skiing after years of not skiing and all of a sudden you put your back out or your knee goes out and you're like, ah, not who I used to be. But the good news actually for Zoomers is actually medical advancement right now is such that, you know, like I don't know if any of you have parents who have had hip replacements or knee replacements. I mean, it's amazing now. And actually our longevity, is, I think I just read that 80 is the average age for, so we're going to, so that means we have to have bionic parts if we're going to live to about 100 or so, right? So um, it's all very exciting, very fascinating. If you are wanting the, the uh, more demographic and hard, hard data, you can go to my website, CherylCran.com. I have a free ebook called Five Ways to Lead the Generations. You can download that. Love that. Um, I brought just a few copies of, of that one uh, as samples. But um, really, in essence, what, what I'm saying to you with this presentation is opening the mind, opening the viewpoint, going from our autocratic leadership as a Zoomer, looking at how can I be more flexible and create movement with the generations in my role as leadership, uh, in your role as government, what does that look like, what does it mean to your strategic plans to add a generational segment and I to what you're, all the, the things you're currently working on. Uh, when I was at the banquet last night, I have to tell you, as a citizen, because I'm not a government person, um, I am a citizen, and uh, I have to say I was so proud that all the initiatives that are going on across Canada that the average person like myself does not even know is happening. And I just think the work you're doing is just so powerful and, and making such a difference in our country. Um, I, I'm just, I, was, I just sat there last night beside Marsha going, holy cow, you guys are doing some great things. I just want to leave you with a final story before we uh, have a break and then head into the, the Communicating with Diverse Team session. Um, the purpose of the story is really to ask yourself, who are you waiting to do the changing? Because a lot of times we hope that other people will do the changing for us, or maybe we don't have to change quite yet. And even though I use the words God and atheist in this final story, it's not a religious story. It really, the moral of the story is, who are you asking to do the changing? And be careful, because you may not get the results you're looking for. So one day this atheist was walking through the woods. It's a beautiful day, green trees, blue sky, gorgeous day. And without any warning, this huge bear jumps out of the woods ready to pounce on the atheist. The atheist shouts at the top of her lungs, oh my god. Everything freezes, including the bear with his paws overhead. This big booming voice comes out of the sky and says, you call on me now? And the atheist says, yes. And the big booming voice says, after all these years, are you finally willing to become a Christian? And the atheist says, no, but could you make the bear one? <laughs> and the voice says, thy will be done. And the bear who was standing there was frozen with his paws overhead, slowly brought his paws together, looked at the atheist, smiled, bared his teeth and said, Lord, Please bless this food I'm about to eat. <laughs> yeah. Be careful who you're asking to do the changing.